Hi, Mage fans. This is your host, Terry Robinson, with Mage of the Podcast. And today, my distinguished guest, friend of the show, is Charles Siegel. And we will be talking about Jewish mysticism, doing a paradigm deep dive of maybe what the game has showed us so far about the interpretation and usage of the real world belief set, what it gets right, what it gets wrong, and how we can add it to our games. Charles, how you doing? I'm doing well. Glad to be here. For paradigm deep dives, I kind of have a fixed block of questions. So some of these may just sound utterly idiotic as I say them out loud. What is the real life inspiration for Judaism? <laughs> that would be the religion of the Jewish people, consisting of about 14 to 16 million people worldwide, almost all of which are in the US or Israel, and which has been practiced in some form for roughly 3,000 years. How about that? When we refer to, though, the the mystical portion of it or the portion we do in Mage, is that something that there is a continuous history of that? Was there a golden age, for instance, of Jewish mysticism or a period where the best known literature or anything like that was produced? So Jewish mysticism, I'm going to be simplifying because thousands of years of history is not going to fit into a podcast easily. But we, we can kind of divide into sort of three let's call it phases, what is now considered to be modern Jewish mysticism. The first two phases happened with a lot of overlap. They're um, Hekelot literature and Merkaba literature. Merkaba means chariot and Hekelot means palaces. They consist of sort of practical everyday magic with Merkaba and visions of God and methods for taking, for leaving your body behind and ascending in your consciousness to the fo- to the foot of the throne in Hekelot. I am using the word ascending both historically and relevant to the game here. Now, most of the stuff that Mage has touched on is more stuff from the more much more recent phase of Jewish mysticism, the Kabbalah, whose name comes from the sa- from roots for secret knowledge and it kind of gets started in late Cordoba Caliphate in Iberia. So that's the 13th century in I- uh, or so. Really hit a big peak in the 16th century in Israel with the work of Isaac Luria. Basically all modern Kabbalah descends from Luria. It first spread among Jewish communities and then, well, Western occultists, Christians, and to a lesser extent, Muslims looked at it and thought, this is cool, mine which was less cool. Now, it sounded like one of the traditions that you had mentioned was kind of the historical uh, idea of a uh, patropaic magic, just protective things to, to keep a house in running order. Is that a, uh, or, or to, to defend you against evil and so on, where the other one seems uh, proper, almost literal definition of a cult, uh, a type of hidden wisdom. Is that a reasonable way to differentiate the two or? Yeah. So for instance, if you're looking for essentially spell lists, Merkaba is the place to go. It's where the origin of this whole, of the whole thing where you evoke the names of angels and they do your bidding comes from. And it can be anything from safeguarding a pregnancy from miscarriage to, you know, we really hate the Romans. Maybe this will kill the governor. And you can find those things in like the same book. And if memory serves, that book is Sefer HaRazim, the Book of Secrets. These are things where you are disproportionately likely to not be able to know to Google it based on the phonetics. So when we are done, uh, Charles has provided a fair number of notes and such. They will be in the show notes. So who are some of the key figures for this paradigm that if your character wanted to be a scholar on a particular person or in a game where we're trying to find the personal affects of a holy person or a prophet or just someone who is insightful or philosophical, are there any names we may want to go into this being familiar with? Yeah, so I mentioned Isaac Luria as one of sort of the founders of the modern uh, Kabbalah. He is from the 1500s-ish. If you got to go further back, some of the rabbis from the Talmud, that's a book of uh, Jewish uh, stories and legal codes and debates around them, especially rabbis Akiva and Eliezer, were very into some of the more magic things. There's a famous story about Rabbi Eliezer lamenting the fact that no one else cares enough to to learn the magic of how to create cucumbers from nothing from him. And there there are so many names. I'm going to have to leave some out. Abraham Abulafia, 13th century Kabbalist. He founded the Meditative Kabbalah, which 
you know, Luria than refined. He was unique in that most of the time when you see texts of mysticism or occultism, they're hidden under layers of meaning, and it's supposed to take you years of study to figure out what to do based on the text. So he just wrote recipes. Mm. He's like, meditate while chanting this sequence of, sil- of syllables and moving your head in this way, and you will achieve an altered state of consciousness that will take you closer to God. Rabbi Lowe of uh, Prague is the rabbi who created a golem. Very famous story, definitely part of Jewish mysticism. You know, predates Kabbalah by over a millennium, predates Hekelot and Merkaba literature a little bit, is a woman more commonly known as uh, Mary the Jewess, or Maria Alchemista, or Miriam the Jew, who was one of the founders of modern alchemy and is credited with inventing some of its glassware. I definitely recommend reading up on her if you're interested in playing an, al- playing an alchemist who wants to have any sort of interface with this sort of thing. Uh, you have the Baal Shem Tov, who founded the movement of Hasidism, which most people think of as being a very straight-laced, super orthodox part of Judaism. And there's that strain too, but uh, less well known is that they are ecstatic in the traditional mystical sense of that was altered, altered state of conscious, consciousness, uh, you know, to achieve that closeness to God. And they are esoteric mystics, especially the Baal Shem Tov. A lot of mysticism made its way into mainstream Judaism through Hasidism. And then there's really modern, like 20th century scholars like Arya Kaplan, Adam Steinsaltz, Lawrence Kushner, Gershom Sholem. Anything by them is reliable and probably insightful. Um, Sholem particularly was not a believer in Jewish mysticism, though he was Jewish. He was studying it purely academically. So you can get a bit more of an outside, uh, sort of half outside, but also half inside perspective from his work. So we have a bunch of names. We have an idea that there are different traditions and different people kind of explored this in a different way. A thing also going in that is useful is, for instance, when we look at Norths and heathenic practices, there are frequently signs that indicate this is no longer the thing we're looking for. Now we're just talking about white ethno-nationalism. When we look into this topic, are there key terms or things in general we should avoid? Not necessarily because they're sacred and we shouldn't involve them in our games because that would just be rude. We'll discuss that later. But kind of when you're doing research, are there any dog whistles or key terms that we can take as a sign that "Mm, maybe I shouldn't be looking here? So one thing that's a fairly good indicator of what you're looking at is that the various not Jewish mysticism versions of Kabbalah that you know were grabbed by occultists or Christians or whatnot come from specific time periods and never looked at the Hebrew again. So they come from different transliterations than what are standard now. So because Jewish mystics learn Hebrew, and so their work tends to be transliterated in whatever the most modern you know transliteration scheme is. And right now, that spells Kabbalah with a K. If you see Kabbalah with a Q, that is usually more occultist. It has diverged so far that it's really just not the same thing at all, though you can kind of see some uh, similarities. It actually draws a lot more from Merkaba than they realize it does. And this is what the Order of Hermes does, like without a doubt. And if you see it spelled with a C, that's very strange, but also a sign of Christianity. Okay. And are they legitimate traditions of occult belief? To answer that, you kind of have to start asking what defines legitimacy Legitimacy. in occult belief. Jews Jews do not generally consider them to be legitimate or worthy of respect. They, again, often have very little to do with actual Jewish Kabbalah. And you get into trouble when you start stating things from Hermetic Kabbalah or Christian Kabbalah as though they were things that Jews believe or did. And then you have the you have other problems like the fact that say in French, basically all occultism is called Kabbalah at this point. You know, it, it's the secret knowledge of that mystical group of people, the Jews. So everything gets called Kabbalah in French. I have confirmed this with at least two French speakers. I, I read this in a book and then I confirmed it with two French speakers. It's just, it's completely weird to me as an English speaker, but apparently that's fairly standard. When we're thinking about this as a paradigm, one of the key questions to me is, so where does magic come from? So 
what is the nature of the cosmos that allows it to exist? Kind of what makes a mage special in this paradigm? And what does a mage doing magic kind of mean? Within Jewish mysticism, there is only one source of supernatural power, and that's God. Beings that are evil are also drawing on the power of God, and they're just misusing it. Uh, But there's only that one source of power. That said, in practice, a lot of it is commanding angels to do th- to do things, and it's almost animistic in many ways that everything has an angel assigned to it, and that angel's name is the same as the name of the thing. If you want to make that rock move over there, then you evoke the appropriate angel in a way that uh, basically informs them that you are communicating God's will to them. And humans stand up, generally stand above angels in many ways because humans have the divine spark of, uh, for creation and angels don't. Angels will often you know, do what humans want if the human knows how to ask correctly. Is that tightly tied to Judaism as a belief, though? It, what I mean by this is we have a notion of, of a covenant where there is some sort of agreement. Is magic drawn from that, from the fact that uh, historically the Jews have presumably a special space that says, hey, we got this thing that says we do this and in exchange that? It's a little bit of column A, a little bit of column B. Okay. Um, so yeah, there, there's the co- the covenant that you know we have all these extra rules mm-hmm. because our ancestors agreed to worship God exclusively and others didn't. And to some mystics, that comes with the benefit of because we are the people of God, you know the angels listen to us first. But that doesn't mean that they don't listen to others. There's a smaller set of rules that you know, non-Jews are supposed to live, are supposed to live by, and that's just fine. And if you're doing that, then there's no problem. And and those rules are things like, don't kill people. So this seems like it is, it is a paradigm that could look at the works of other paradigms and be, that makes sense to me. You're pronouncing the name real weird. And that's not what that rock likes to be called. Yeah. I don't know how that machine is evoking, is evoking that name, but Hey, if it works for you, it works for you. I'm just going to, you know, pray, right. (laughs) Now, when you say the will of God, what does that mean? That's a complicated issue. Um, one thing to keep in mind is that despite many popular beliefs, you know, many f- admittedly funny jokes, Judaism does not believe that God is a man in the sky. In a sense, the Jewish God is unknowable because the Jewish God, the Jewish God is somewhat alien. It is everything and it is everything all at once. Though masculine pronouns are often used. God is not male. Like many gendered languages, masculine pronouns are used when men, men and women, or indeterminate groups are used. So you see a lot of addresses to he and him, but God's not a man and God's not a woman. Uh, God is is both simultaneously, but also not really either. And that's true of almost every characteristic you could apply. Any sort of comprehensible version of God that exists in your head is only a partial version of it, especially in, and Jewish mysticism, a lot of it is concerned with how can we begin to expand our minds to encompass a greater fraction of God? So then God's will is going to be mysterious because God is incomprehensible. So that person who's doing something that seems truly horrible and evil to you, they may be just abusing the power that they, ha- that they have through, through their knowledge of God, or they may be doing something correct that you just don't understand. And you don't know, you just have to make the best judgment you can based on what you see. There's a strains of thought where, you know, if God touched the universe directly, it would destroy it, say, by merging it back with God or something. So there are several layers of reality between God and the world we live in that were created by different layers of angels. And uh, th- this can get very complicated, as I hope I've demonstrated. And there are not simple answers here. 
Let's break that down into a few things. One, we have an Old Testament tradition that prophets would frequently be asked to do weird things to kind of show God's otherness. You have the kind of the ancient temple experience where part of it was to make it a very different space. You would go from this bright, well-lit street where it was literally illuminated the sun to this relatively dark place that had intermittent illumination that frequently had um, incest depending on on what area you were in that was filled with smoke. You have the, the call of God is great is is how it's frequently translated into English, but in some cases, a better translation is apparently God is other. You have the Islamic mystics who very much pick up on the, the Jewish mystical tradition of incomprehensibility, and we get the idea of understanding being apophatic or fundamentally silent. One thing I want to emphasize is that contrary to popular belief, there's a strong argument that Judaism and Islam have more in common than either of them does with Christianity, especially in the co- concern of their notion of who and what God is and the nature of the divine. One of the things that kind of comes up when you're when you're talking about abusing the power of God, is there a notion in Jewish mysticism of dominion that humans by some property it is right for them to control creation? Or is all power kind of borrowed from God? Is it ac- are you accessing a kind of mystic physics? How do we interpret kind of the wisdom and power that magic gives us? Again, we have 3,000 years of this, and so naturally you have a lot of different versions and variations and arguments, especially when it comes to you know, Jews trying to agree on anything. A part of it is that humans have a piece of the divine in them, which you could easily make analogous to the avatar. That spark of divinity comes with both power and responsibility, you know, as with you know, all our greatest superhero, of course. So the power is, there is a certain amount of dominion over the world, but there's a responsibility to be good caretakers and also to fix it. Judaism does have the notion that the world itself is, on some level, broken, whether that's because it was once uh, right and and was broken by you know, Adam and Eve, though that's a very unpopular opinion. Like Judaism doesn't really have original sin in the way Christianity does. There was the first sin, but that's different. Or whether it means that creation was not completed by God and it is our job to finish it and to and that finishing is perfecting it. That's a very powerful notion in both Jewish religion, Jewish culture, and in and in and it shows through in the mysticism. One of the great mystic, this is gonna sound more um historic than it does with the way I phrase it. One of the great mystic verses I've ever seen is from Leonard Cohen's song Anthem. There's a crack in everything. That's how the light gets in. The idea being that that imperfection in the universe and in everything else is how the light of God gets through and how we can perceive God by finding the spots he left for us to fix. If one believes that another is using that power unjustly, who is the agent of justice or vengeance in this? Is this something where God acts directly, or where there are prophets that are supposed to transmit this well, or the angels rebel? To me, this also gives us an idea of kind of what paradox would look like. How does the universe, as it were, kind of push back against the practitioner? So in some mythological, historical contexts, God it's suggested that God acts directly, but it's often interpreted as angels speaking for God act and punish the wicked in some sense. But one thing to consider is that a lot of the sacred texts of early Judaism boil down to big codes of laws and consequences for breaking those laws. And these were the laws of the ancient kingdoms of Israel and Judah. There were courts. If you if you did something wrong, you were tried. Those courts would not be considered fair by modern standards, but they were generally fair fair by ancient world standards. And there ha- and there were a couple of interesting legal innovations that people are beginning to rediscover today and think, oh, that's a good idea. Like one of my favorite rulings is that in a death sentence case. If all of the judges in the trial agree that you should die, you're acquitted. Because if there's unanimous consent that you should die, then that means there's something probably biasing the judges, and we don't want to kill anyone who shouldn't be killed. As much as the death sentence is prescribed for a lot of things in Leviticus, for instance, ancient Jewish kingdoms actually use the death penalty extremely rarely compared to their neighbors. So what separates the awakened from the non-awakened in this worldview? 
actually fairly little. A lot of it is that in some sense, it's similar to the technocratic view that it's a matter of knowledge and practice more than it is a matter of you are a truly deeply special person. Like there's a certain amount of this person is holy, but a person is holy because of how they behave. It's not just strict knowledge of I studied a lot and therefore I can do this. You also have to put that knowledge into practice and you know, do the appropriate rituals and so on. But the, I imagine that among, say, a Jewish craft, and we'll talk about how that has worked out in Mage in the past, the line between sleeper acolyte, sorcerer, and awakened mage is fairly blurry, and it's treated as more of a matter of degree than kind. So what would the spheres map onto, if anything? Is there a natural division into the world or of its component parts or of expertise in Jewish mysticism? Not a, not especially. The spheres would just be fields of study. Presumably among mages, there are books that are like Sefer HaRazim that I mentioned earlier, have like lists of the names of angels that are relevant to this sphere specific rituals on how to evoke them to get some basic things, then you should figure it out on your own to do more, more general stuff. But this, there, there isn't a natural division, including it. There isn't really a natural, a hugely natural division between the physical and the spiritual, spiritual, like lots of spiritual entities are just treated as, yeah, they live among us. They're intangible. That's life. They're people too. Some of them are assholes. Are angels only something tied to physical things or are there angels of abstraction? Is there an angel that oversees love or mathematics? Absolutely. Yeah, it, there's angels of everything. Every conceptual thing, it's all out there somewhere. Yeah, th there are some ways that Merkaba especially is very similar to animistic traditions. And Though I, I know a lot of people would see it as being a little bit odd, I see no conflict, say, between, you know, a practicing Jew being a dream speaker with this, especially when you take into account that whole spiritual beings live among, live among us. They're just intangible. They're, they're just like, your, they're your neighbors. There's just, you don't see them all the time. It is a worldview that allows for there to be other types of people that are sapient in the world that just engage with it differently. What to you is the nature of quintessence or tass in the paradigm? Does it have a, a notion of uh, divine or, or universal energy or, or materialized potence? The closest I could come to really making it something natural in the paradigm is that it's some residue of the divine, it's divine sparks. So mm -hmm. there's a lot of discussion of divine sparks in Kabbalistic works. And I'll talk about that more in a bit when we talk about some places where this has appeared in mage in the past. These sparks could easily be representations of quintessence. Tasks, it would just be, you know, things that contain a divine spark. You, and depending on the form, you could easily have have tasks that say takes the form of manna from heaven that you consume, and that gives and that gives you the energy to do the magic. Objects that are special tend to be special because people made them in some way. So, wonders and artifacts and grimoires and so and primers feel more natural in the paradigm than quintessence or tasks. You you can fit it in because it's an absorbed fact of may, of the world of darkness that these things exist. One thing that historically Jewish mysticism has done is has worked very hard to not contradict the observation of the actual world. Is there a natural way in which nodes would fit in? Some nodes would be sacred, place, just sacred places, places where something has happened or someone special is buried. So there, there's a bunch of pilgrimage sites that are the tombs of various historic and mythic figures. There's the tomb of the patriarchs, which is where supposedly Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are buried. The tomb of Joseph, which Joseph was supposedly buried in. Um, there's a tomb in Iran that is the supposed resting place of Mordecai from the Book of Esther. And, and these are all important sites. Uh, I would definitely put nodes there. There's, of course, the, the, you know, the Temple Mount, which is almost certainly the single one of the most contested nodes on the planet. Uh, what is the Temple Mount for those not familiar? About 3,000 years ago. The Jewish king decided that this is where we're going to build a, build a temple to God. Tradition says it was David. 
but Solomon, but Solomon actually built it. We don't have strong evidence about David and Solomon in the archaeological record. The strong evidence really starts like two to three generations later. But the weak evidence is enough to think that there's probably someone by those names ish. Anyway, they built a temple at a spot that was supposedly the most sacred place where God commanded it built. A few hundred later years later, it was demo- it was demolished by Babylonians who invaded. Some stuff happened. And by some stuff, I mean several hundred years of history. <laughs> Eventually, Jews became sovereign in the, in the in Jerusalem again, built a second temple in the same spot. Some stuff happened. Rome happened. They demolished the temple. And that's when the area got its name Palestine uh, from the Romans. A few hundred years later, you know, Islam expanded and conquered the region. And because that site was sacred with Jews and with Christians, it's very close to a place called the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, which is an important pilgrimage site in Christianity. And again, it's important partly because of its proximity to the temple. Like that's why it figures in things. Then the Muslims who conquered the area built their own place of worship on the Temple Mount, the Al-Aqsa Mosque, which stands there to this day and is a flashpoint for tensions in the area. Everyone wants to be involved in things there because it's sacred to so many people, not just locally, but globally. It's been very difficult finding an agreement that everyone can be, can be happy with, or at least equally unhappy to you, are there any things that are strictly ruled out by this paradigm? Is it one of those things where resurrection is impossible or you can't go back in time? Is there anything where the paradigm simply says you cannot do this or this is not something within the dominion of practice? Fairly little, actually. Like Resurrection is not only possible. There are several stories of Talmudic rabbis doing resurrections. And of course, there's stories of prophets doing it uh, earlier. But even if you're willing to say the age of prophets is over, which Judaism says, which means that your character is not a prophet, you know, it's still well within what the paradigm permits if you are sufficiently holy and knowledgeable. There are stories involving time travel forward, but I've not heard any that involve time travel backwards. Like a lot of vulgar magic, not all of it, but a lot of it would feel awkward, but that's really the case with most real world mysticisms and magical practices, because people historically have been able to do them and see you did not, in fact, throw a fireball. So you're probably not throwing a fireball with, with this if you're going to stick to strictly, properly done mysticism, Jewish mysticism. That's not great fun for the game. So instead of saying all vulgar magic or all magic that would have been considered vulgar by first century Judeans is impossible, I tend to just say that it's a little bit more work to figure out how to do it. With, with a paradigm with this much history and detail to it, I do tend to, for most things, if you want to do it, you have to know something, you have to have done something similar or do some research. Like researching the names of angels is just a part of every piece of magic and you're doing it constantly. The place that you see this magic most often, it would be in the order of Hermes because a lot of pra- there's a lot of practice overlap because the order of Hermes borrowed a lot of the early stuff and then called it Kabbalah. Now, when you say research, is that a academic, a mystical inner process? What could... Yes. Okay. It's all, it's all of the above. Like, if you're trying to work out a new spell, for lack of better terms, you start by going to important mystic texts and seeing if you can find any hints in that general direction. Another avenue is, uh, I mentioned meditation with especially um, Abraham Abulafia's work. Meditation on the divine to seek inspiration is a common thing, but then that inspiration needs to be grounded in the tradition in some way. So it's a combination of mystical research, academic research, and uh, revelation. Is there anything you feel the paradigm is particularly good at where your characters could reasonably seek out an expert in blank? Especially useful for mage games, especially ones that involve the Order of Hermes, the Celestial Chorus, or the Ali Batin, all of whom do something that they label Kabbalah deriving the names of angels that have never been encountered before. It's a, it's actually a mundane expertise, but it's an expertise that Jewish mystics have. As far as magical techniques, I think often more than can do something that the characters can't do, it's going to be has a radically different perspective on things than the char- than the characters. While there are other worlds in the in Jewish mysticism like places that you could travel, say with spirit magic, they look nothing like any description of the Umbra. 
So you could argue that you can get to places that traditional magic doesn't know exist. One story is that in, during creation, this was not the first world created. God created several worlds along the way, both to buffer the final, the final version of creation from God's presence and in some readings as practice. And there are strange alien beings there. I have definitely seen some people reinterpret this as God created other planets with life on them first. I've also seen just these are other dimensions and this is where various spiritual beings come from. Most of the sources just call them people. Uh, or, you know, a different kind of human even, but they are just fundamentally different. So some of these other worlds are places that have resources that you might even want. So uh, as an example, so one set of uh, stories revolves around the seven material worlds that were created that culminate in the world we live in, and that Adam traveled through after expulsion from the Garden of Eden. And the lowest of them is called Erez. It's described as being so dark, there's not even a single ray of light, a complete and utterly empty void of nothingness, except that is where a sword that is constantly rotating and wreathed in flames is. Like, arguably, this could be, say, the sword of the Archangel Michael. This is not a thing that really fits into descriptions of the Umbra. It's somehow a cross between earth and the abyss but it's not like a complete sinkhole that you can never leave adam just walked out so presumably a spirit mage who under who believes this world exists who knows how to get find it could go there gain some insight from the sword or if they're willing to do something that may have a bad consequence that may have consequences for them later could even borrow the sword and then come back to earth do a thing and just it's strongly recommended that you put th- that you put things back where you found them because there are angels whose job it is to make sure that things are running correctly. And if that sword's not there, things aren't running correctly. And you can interpret those as paradox spirits. So this is something we could where we could interpret that as maybe quite literally a, a long time ago before the umber goes up, there was the there were these other sets of places that are still reachable by people who know the kind of the right way to move around in the world, maybe with a little bit of spirit to get it going. Or these could be uh, realms that have portals particularly tied to it, or it could be another place entirely. It seems like it gives a good other model for other places that could be out there. If you don't want to go just be like, it's just another realm. Yeah, one way that I would consider modeling these is actually with the, uh, I think it's Dead Magic 2 has the dream time uh, as sort of a, it's kind of sort of umbral, but not really. It's also kind of sort of material and it's overlaid and only the appropriate people can get there. Like I could see shallow realms being a very useful way to handle these. And frankly, a lot of other culturally specific realms in a way that means that If you want to get something from one of these realms, you have to go find a Jewish mystic to do it or become a Jewish mystic to do it. If you're just like a hermetic who has heard of these things, you just can't get there. What does increasing arite mean for a practitioner? So this is where we start getting into things that Mage has said about Kabbalah that I think of as being completely misunderstanding it. And also it's missed opportunities. In revised, particularly in the Ali Bateen chapter of Lost Paths, they try to put the spheres in correspondence with the sephir- with the sephirot from Kabbalah. I'm not getting, we'll talk more about the sephirot later, I'm sure. I, I find that to be very awkward and looking in the wrong direction. The sephirot don't correspond to lighting things on fire. There, there's no sephirot of fire. There's no sephirot of fi- of you know mind control. The sephirot correspond to aspects of God and increasing arete in Jewish mysticism would correspond to obtaining a greater understanding of God and ascending the tree of life towards a greater sense of oneness with the divine. Coincidentally, and this is great, though there are nine spheres, there are 10 sephirot and 10 dots on the arete track. So that's really, really not nice if you want to treat increasing arete as being a path through the sephirot especially because there's 10 sephirot, but there's also 22 paths between those 10 sephirot. And so each practitioner can take their own path through all 10. And so you don't even have to feel locked between the same ordering or whatnot. Just start at the bottom and at the top, do something in between that gets you to all 10. And is it one of those things where we would be able to reasonably tie it to seekings, where each one of those has a representation where you can say the challenger trial or 
part of reflection of this seeking is going to be tied to that. Do we get that kind of list or uh, correspondence? Oh, you, you definitely could do something like that. So for instance, for example, the Sephirot uh, Chesed translates to kindness or loving kindness. And you could easily have a trial for that where the mage has to in some way sacrifice uh, their own interests for the interests of someone of someone else because they have become kind. And others, you have things like wisdom and understanding, which you can interpret in a variety of ways. The Hebrew has specific connotations, but they get lost in translation a lot. And then there's things like like foundation. There's no seeking for that. That's your awakening. That's the first place. That's the bottom sephirot. And as you ascend through the sephirot, you start at Malkut, which is kingship, which is that sort of also comes to that notion of humanity has dominion over the world, but also a responsibility towards it. And you, you pass through the various things. You become a better person in many ways, but most, but most importantly for this, you're becoming more like God. In, a mage, in mage terms, in mechanical terms, yeah, you're becoming more like God. You're becoming more powerful. You're able to do more things and so on. But in paradigm, you're becoming more, you're more able to reflect the important aspects of God. You, are having, you have a greater understanding of what God is and how you can emulate it. There's a saying that the reason that Judaism bans graven images, that's images of God, is because the only medium which can accurately depict God is a human life lived. And so your goal then becomes to live that life properly in whatever sense that means. Again, there's lots of argument about that topic. What are the associated practices and instruments tied to this paradigm? So We've, we've mentioned a lot about the academic portion of things that you would have researched in text and recitation and so on. What are some of the other forms that could take on? Is there a meditative or a contemplative or a, a drug use uh, tradition or anything? Absolutely. All of the above. I, drug use a little bit less prom, less prominent though, be, because altered states of consciousness are usually achieved through um, intensive prayer, dancing, etc. There's definitely some drug use in the, in the ancient usage of the paradigm also. Yeah, I, I mentioned meditative, meditative Kabbalah is a pretty big thing. It's actually getting mainstreamed in some sense. I live in Seattle and Seattle has a synagogue that builds itself as a meditative synagogue in the Kabbalistic sense. Uh, what would differentiate that from maybe other traditions of meditation? So Kabbalistic meditation, it's not about emptying the mind per se. It's about filling the mind with God. Uh, and uh, you empty your mind to get there because you have to have nothing obstructing. It's not sort of the Zen meditation where you become sort of expel everything. And that is the goal in and of itself. The goal is an experience of God. Now, that said... There is some scholarly evidence that the Kabbalistic meditation tradition does have some cross-pollination with Buddhism through layers of translation and misunderstanding because it because Abulafia's uh, meditative work was in the 12th century, was in the 1200s. It was in the 1200s in Europe where there was not very much in the way of Buddhism or our accurate understanding of the religious practices of the East, just rumors, legends, and the occasional traveler on the Silk Road. We have the notion that mages are commonly doing certain effects. If you could give me an idea, and it doesn't need to be necessarily canonical, I'm a mage, I wish to issue a direct forces attack of some sort. How would a Jewish mystic practitioner maybe do that? So historic practitioners wouldn't, but we're talking about mage. So the simplest way is the way that really kind of looks like a cross between what you, the sort of stereotypical hermetic and chorister, you evoke the appropriate angels for fire for a direct forces attack, especially with fire. Michael is a very good choice. Uriel is good if you want to use light. His name actually means light of God. So very, you know, on the nose, especially useful against vampires. You would evoke them by their true, by their true names, which in Jewish practice are in Hebrew. The Details of how you evoke them have varied a lot over the last couple thousand years. Like in Sefer HaRazim, one thing you'll notice is there's a lot of inscribing names on copper plates, and specifically copper. Very important that it be copper. You inscribe a bunch of names, and they all be the right names in the right order. And then you also do some other ritual thing. Now that is slow, and is part of a practice that does very subtle magics. For forces attacks, I would say prepared an evocation on 
you know, an appropriate scroll. Vellum is, is, pop, is popular with um, sacred things in Judaism. Perhaps an appropriate line from a psalm. There's, there's a couple of psalms that show up in uh, specific spell recipes. But for, a forces attack is actually kind of a tricky thing to, to fit in. Not because it's not possible, but because, again, all the, the historical examples are slower and subtler. And we are talking about a, histor- a historical and modern real world paradigm. You know, but evoking the true names of angels through faith and high rit- and high ritual magic to you know hit some keywords from the books is going to go a long way. You're going to use a lot of writing as part of it. Writing is a sacred act in Judaism, especially sacred names. If uh, angels don't have enough punch to do what you want, there's the famous four letter name of God that we don't say. There's a lot of other names of God that are also used in mysticism and ritual magic in Judaism. So sometimes those are the right thing to evoke, but like defense against a forces attack is actually much easier than a forces attack. Like I can actually tell you exactly how a, uh, you know, like a 16th century Jewish mystic would have protected them from themselves from attack. That's that there is a Psalm that does not use a specific letter of the Greek alphabet. That letter is named for the word for sword, which it is the first letter of, because it doesn't use that word, that letter. It is that Psalm is treated as an abjuration against swords. And because we use the same word for swords and penises, it is also an abjuration against pregnancy. Is there a notion of teleportation or getting somewhere quickly? So getting places quickly, there's a lot of just, you need to travel so God handles it in the mysticism. Close to that, though, is astral projection, which is a very common effect described through that meditation that I mentioned. So astral projection, scrying, those things all tend to be associated with the, medita- with the meditative work. How about transmutation, turning one thing into another thing or manifesting something from nowhere? So that is a tricky thing, not because it's, you know, vulgar and this is a paradigm that fits into, you know, the real world in the present day, but because it's a thing that actually I should have mentioned as being particularly, probably particularly difficult for a Jewish mystic to do. Okay. Because changing one thing to another fundamentally different thing involves changing its name. Process in the mystic mind goes, this thing is identified with its angel. Angels, in some sense, are exactly equal to their name. So if you change the name of that angel, you change the angel and you change the thing. How you go about that is a much bigger and more difficult question. And this is going to be heavy ritual stuff lots of sympathetic connections. Uh, you're, going to, you're going to want something that evokes the thing you're changing it to. You're going to be, say, writing out the name some vast number of times in order to cement it. This is a good place to bring in numerology. Like it would be easier if the two things have the same, uh, have the same value in, sev- in various numerological systems. Like if this word adds up to 212 and that word adds up to 212, well, they're kind of the same word anyway. That's much easier transformation to make than if, than 212 to 215. Like I would have a character need to assemble things on both sides of the transmutation that add up to the same value in order for it to happen. So one of the things that you've talked about repeatedly are uh, names and such. Is there a notion of true names as kind of something that is directly manipulable or directly discoverable or interfaceable? Yes, there is. So as I said, angels are identified fully with their names. The names of God are extremely potent and powerful words. And in some sense, so most Jews have a second name that is for used for ritual purposes. That's in Hebrew. And I would argue that within the Jewish mystic paradigm, that is the true name of that person. And these are very important. True names are going to be one of those, in, one of the most important instruments, like true names, writing, language, and the line between language and math is very thin also. A lot of uh, hermetic numerology derives from, say, from the gematria, which is a way of associating words to numbers to uncover correspondences between seemingly distinct things. And, and then there's various subcategories and, and maneuvers you can do with it that will let you change the numbers in certain ways and so on. But yeah, true names are definitely a very important part of the traditional mystical paradigm uh, in Judaism. Within the world of mage, are there any ideas from this paradigm or that are notionally from this paradigm? What are they? How are they presented? And is it accurate to, to Jewish mysticism? There's a decent amount that's borrowed 
partly because a lot of occult traditions have borrowed a lot and mage very much is part of that occult tradition. So I've already mentioned the Sephiroth, uh, which, you know, Hermetics, Choristers, and, and Batini all evoke directly, and the Batini book specifically tried to correlate to the spheres, which, as I said, I don't really find uh, believable. Instead, I feel that the, they correspond more to Arate dots. My favorite thing from Jewish mysticism that is in Mage is Gilgal, though it's very different in Jewish mysticism, but it kind of fits where the Order of Hermes was when they developed the ritual. In Mage, we know the Gilgal ritual destroys an avatar, but it was developed hundreds of years ago. And at the time, the Order of Hermes believed that you could not destroy an avatar. There is a notion in Judaism of Gilgulim Hanefesh, which is the cycle of souls. So, hey, look, inspiration for your, for your Jewish euthanatos. This is the cycle of reincarnation in mystic Judaism. Most people don't think of Judaism as having a lot of reincarnation in it because religions that descend from Judaism don't. And they, they have a very definite, you go through once and then you're in heaven or hell or whatever. Judaism is a lot more agnostic about the afterlife and a lot more focused on the here and now. So reincarnation has basically always been treated as a possibility. Its popularity has increased or decreased over time. There's a very important mystical work called Sha'ar HaGigulim, which is the Gates of Reincarnation, which is about the cycle of reincarnation in Jewish mysticism. And at the time, the Order of Hermes didn't believe you could destroy an avatar. They thought they were just sending it onto a new incarnation fresh. So naming it Gilgal, like as sending it along the cycle to its next incarnation, is a perfectly reasonable thing to do. But now with greater understanding of what the Gilgal ritual does, you can see it that the Gilgal ritual has diverged from the Jewish meaning. Now we should probably address the, you know, the elephant in the room, which is the, uh, as I would pronounce it, the Kalipot or the Klipoth in Mage. Note the Q. Mage always uses a Q for them. This is from Hermetic versions, which varies a lot from traditional Jew, uh, Jewish uh, mysticism. Before I said, I said I was going to say a good thing about Book of the Fallen, I think I forgot to actually say the good thing, which is that it associates the Sephirot with increasing Arate, that Nefandic seekings go through this sort of inverted version of the Sephirot. Now, I'm also going to say bad things about that, which is that these bear very little similarity to anything in Jewish mysticism these sort of inverted sephirot that they're calling the clip off. And the book does explicitly call that Jewish mysticism, which is not great. And worst, and so in some sense, worst of all, one of the descriptions talks about Christ. It's really weird to bring up Christ in Jewish mysticism. He does not have any place in Jewish mysticism. He is not important to, Jew to Judaism at all. A, a, lot of, a lot of what he said was evoking uh, the earlier Rabbi Hillel. As far as making the Nefandi fully on board with Jewish mysticism like Book of the Fallen does, I'm not a fan. And especially because this interpretation of the Kalipot as being the source of evil is in some sense a misunderstanding of the original texts. Though the word evil in Hebrew is used, it's a very surface level understanding of something that's intended not to be read at the surface level. A, more correct, not entirely correct because there's layers upon layers upon layers, uh, but a more correct interpretation is that the evil is falsehood, that the kelipot are, or shells wrap are falsehoods wrapped around divine sparks, that it is our job to penetrate so that we can understand the world and, and repair it. And one thing that means is that Jewish mystics engage with the kelipot, and they're not in the fandy. They're doing this in order to make the world a better place. In some sense, it's kind of the opposite of they are evil and they are what gives the Nefandi their powers. So, uh, so can you then give us a definition, uh, a description of how the Kilipot would appear in game? Is it a place that you would visit? Is it strictly uh, metaphorical? Um, how, how would it actually be in there? I would largely have it be metaphorical. Like any falsehood that hides divine truth is a Kilipot. Oh, a kilipa. If, if you want to tie the nefandi to the to the kilipot, I think you can still do it in a reasonable way. 
where the Nefandi, they are evil and that has trapped them in falsehood. It makes the Nefandic path one that doesn't lead to ascension, that it leads in the opposite direction. Instead of achieving a greater truth, they are achieving the greatest falsehood, wrapping themselves in one, in one Kalipa after another. So the association of Kalipot with the Nefandi is not even entirely wrong. It's just kind of often the, it started in a place that makes sense and then just went in a direction that is based on several hundred years of occultists not quite understanding the original texts properly. Now, is there a relationship then between, you had made mention earlier, that there were there were places that this was not the first reality. Those are separate then from the, the Kilipot? So the seven material worlds that I mentioned are not, are completely separate from the Kilipot. They're actually just part of this universe that are normally inaccessible to humans. So but, those are the things that you can go visit. <laughs> yeah. Okay. But there's also the notion of prior creations that failed in some way and that and they are also sometimes called kelipot because a, kel- a kelipa is a shell by itself the word doesn't have the connotation of evil so these empty world these empty failed creations are shells as in they are not full creation but these falsehoods are shells around truth you could conflate them like you could have that these other worlds trap the greatest, you know, contain the, are the greatest falsehoods containing some powerful truths. If you, if you wanted to, that would be a reasonable way to tie the two uses of Kelipa together. The notion of them as other worlds that Nefandi visit during their seekings and no one else can ever get to is not great. The other like figure that I see all the time is the Sephirot or the tree of life or the inverted tree of life. What is that? And should we even be using it? So the tree of life, you know, in Hebrew, it's Chaim and the Sephirot or spheres. I, I guarantee you that the correspondence between the spheres of mage and the spheres of the Sephirot are just a literal translation thing. Though both really are spheres of influence and they're just completely separate versions of it is in some sense, a map of the, a map of how to get to the divine. There's 10 Sephirot. There's Again, I said 22 paths, one for each Hebrew letter. The arrangement of the paths varies. There's lots of different versions of it. Several of them appear in, for instance, Sefer Yetzirah, which is the book of creation. Link in the show notes. And and the different uh, arrangements have different symbolism attached to them, but they're all sort of equally valid. So for the Tree of Life, I I would very much treat it, as I I mentioned earlier, I would treat it as a map towards higher arete for Jewish mystics and those who work with Jewish mystical methods. Uh, As far as whether it should be used or not in your game, probably in a way that a lot of people are going to be surprised at, considering the way I react to a lot of things. I think that there is a way to use basically all of this respectfully. The problem is that people don't do it respectfully. Not that they use it at all. There are many people who disagree with me. Um, If you go back to the interview with uh, James Sombrano, where he talks about native uh, indigenous magic, you'll get the same caveats from him. You know, I don't represent all Jews. You know, we are famously a people who have trouble getting to consensus on anything. If you approach it from a perspective of respect and do a certain amount of research, then you could portray basically all of this in your game, if you're careful and respectful about it. Now, the line between what is respectful and what is disrespectful is going to be something that people will disagree on, and that's something you should be aware of going in. I find the Book of the Fallen extremely disrespectful in this sense, not just because of the misunderstandings of what the Kalipot are, but for things like calling it Jewish mysticism and then evoking Christ. Like that specific thing stood out to me a lot. And it just kind of feels gauche to be like, hey, This is what these people do. It's identical to, and they're the evil guys. These people do the same thing too, to not draw an inference. (laughs) The secret organization of evil do of evildoers who want to bring down the, who want to bring down the world happen to use Jewish mysticism is not a good look. Yeah. Yes. One thing you'd have to do before using serious Jewish mysticism and anything I'd say is educate yourself on anti-Semitism. Be careful not to be evoking some of those stereotypes. Like, like that stereotype right there that there is an evil cabal of Jews who want to destroy society is a stereotype that has gotten many Jews killed. It still exists and 
distressingly is distressingly common to this day. And Book of the Fallen, I'm going to give benefit of the doubt and say unintentionally referencing that is not good. And you need to be careful about those things. Dumb question. Is there a good quick reference one can get on anti-Semitic tropes? Uh, because I think of a game where we have golems, where we have a group called the NWO, where a group of mages is called a cabal, where we have uh, a phylacteries as a thing. Yeah. I don't have a quick reference offhand. I will go and find a couple of things to put in the show notes. Mage is built on that conspiratorial mindset. And unfortunately, a lot of conspiracies boil down to, well, the Jews. It's a really unfortunate thing because... If you remove that element, conspiracies can be very fun, and that's part of where Mage gets a lot of its fun from. Yeah, it's, it's a place where you have to be careful. Uh, yeah, you've got, yes, you said, you have the New World Order, you have Cabals, you have, uh, what was the other thing you mentioned? Is it Phylactery? Yeah, so Phylactery actually is not really an issue, uh, in my opinion. Okay. Uh, so a phylactery is a Greek term for a type of amulet. In Judaism, we have a thing called tefillin, which are translated as phylactery, but no very few Jews call them phylacteries. Okay. They're really not the same thing. Uh, what about the concept of the golem, which in general I now just say kind of automata or reanimate, which are, are different phenomenon? Avoiding the term golem is probably best practice. I prefer to use golem to specifically mean an artificial being created for the purpose of defense of a Jewish community. And, and I treat the specific writing on the forehead, um, emet, which is truth, and then you can erase the uh, first letter to get met, which is death, uh, to sort of deactivate it. I, I treat that as being sort of an essential characteristic of a golem. Honestly, okay with saying that hermetics make golem-like things that would be kind of offensive to Jews. A lot of things hermet hermetics do are kind of offensive to a lot of people. Hermeticism is sort of the magpie of mysticism. They see something shiny and they take it and incorporate it. And that's their thing. I don't feel like you need to downplay that, but you just need to be aware of the fact that what they're doing is not going to be popular with the people they're borrowing stuff from. Like I mean, Crowley borrowed from yoga. And I've heard quite a few um, South Asians who are into yoga, tan you know, tantric mysticism say that they really hate his his stuff on yoga and i can relate his stuff on kabbalah is just as bad and i just i understand why that's bad better than i understand why his stuff on yoga is bad but i understand that it is bad on the other hand it's hardly priority one in these matters so like don't feel bad if you slip up and call something a golem that i would not call a golem i, I would put more effort into say altering uh, the Book of the Fallen description of the Nefandi to not evoke those tropes. Are there any Jewish mystic groups that you feel that already exist in Mage that we can use? Yes, there are. So there's one that I like from Sorcerer. The Sorcerer is called the Mogan Chachav. That is a slight error. They should probably be called the Mogan Halev or Halav because someone did the math wrong at naming them. So they're a group of sorcerers who, so Mogan is shield and, and, and Hav or Lev are words being used to represent numbers. So their name is supposed to mean shield of the 36. Hav is 32. Lev, which is 36, is a much better choice also because Lev is also heart. And the 36 refer to 36 righteous men, uh, man here, traditionally does in fact mean man, but you could easily shift that to meaning human, whose righteousness holds up the world. If they were to be corrupted, the world would end. So this sorcerer's group has devoted themselves to protecting these 30, finding who they are and protecting these 36. It's a very good use of Jewish mysticism. So that 36 comes from Jewish mysticism. This belief does exist within Jewish mysticism. And the number 36 seems... I don't want to say odd because it's even, but seems strange to people who don't know any anything about Jewish mysticism. But the line between Jewish religion and Jewish culture and Jewish mysticism is very blurry. And the word for life, chai, has the numerological value of 18. And so there's two life worth of, me of people on whom the universe relies. So that's who they're protecting. I like this group a lot. I did not change their name for Paths of Power because consistency with past material was 
you know, of value to me, but, you know, feel free to change their name, you know, in their in games. And also just shield of the heart is also just an awesome name for a group, especially when you have that double meaning of heart and 36. And they're also the sort of the core of existence in some way. And you get a lot of fun numerology and wordplay with that. There is also the lions of Zion, which I can't say that they're disrespectful because they're treated very carefully in the Sorcerer's Crusade material where they're really discussed. And conversations with mage writers, I'm pretty sure that they were written by Richard Dansky, who you know, knows what he's talking about, was in charge of Wraith for the writing of Charnel Houses of Europe, which is a difficult and fantastic book if, uh, for Wraiths who were Jews who died in the Holocaust. It is not a light read, to say the least. It treats everything with the appropriate level of seriousness, in my opinion. It's sort of a perfect example of how to gamify very serious heart, you know, materials and do it well. The Lions of Zion, honestly, they mostly annoy me because they're a group that speaks Hebrew and Yiddish and their name is a joke in, in English. In what way is it a joke? Or, or sorry, it's not a joke, but it sort of rhymes. It, like it's you, it's I, designed for English speakers. And... I feel like that's a coincidence because there's a because Zion and Lion are are well established at least in my mind tying to Judaism. I don't I don't know that it's explicit, well, it, but but it, it, it's kind of awkward if you were to write it out in Hebrew. It's just okay. not a very natural name. Got it. In my stuff that mm-hmm. involves Jewish mysticism. I'll mention it here, even though I'm sure it's something to mention at the end of the show. I'm I'm very, very slowly working on a Storyteller's Vault supplement on this stuff. Every time I think I've got enough research, I find something else I need to read urgently because it's got something important in it. And the problem is I've got thousands of years of literature that's like that. So at some point, I just need to, you know, draw a line in the sand and say, anything on the other side of this line, I just can't worry about. And I think I'm going to get to that point next year. But in that, my interpretation is that the Lions of Zion are a name given to a sort of an alliance of different groups of Jewish mystics by outsiders who saw them defending um, Jewish people from attack. Because naturally, if I'm making a book about Jewish mages, I'm going to have more than one craft of Jewish mages in it. So I treat it as sort of a confluence of a group that could easily fit in with the Euthanatos called the Sikarikim, who are a historical group who were basically Jewish assassins, like almost ninjas, who targeted the imperial government of Rome in Judea. The Kohanim, which is the priest caste, who have a lot of the more faith-based, very biblical magic. And this one's definitely a, a half Greek, half Hebrew joke, which makes sense because there's a lot of, there is some Greek philosophy that gets into Kabbalah, into Kabbalah like sort of an Eastern Mediterranean fusion in many ways. The Ein Sophists, so Ein Sof is uh, sort of a notion of infinity in and God in Kabbalah. And, but the, they, they are the Kabbalists who have that mixture of some Greek, a little bit of Neoplatonic philosophy uh, to them. I treat the Lions of Zion as being essentially a name for the three of them working together to, say, push back Crusaders. You know, these three groups are not going to get along super well, so I'm, you know, setting up all sorts of conflict there. Uh, Historically, the priests and the uh, Sikari team did not get along very well and had very different approaches to handling the Roman occupation. Uh, But you can also look at these groups and either treat them as crafts or treat them as sub-factions of the Euthanatoi, the Celestial Chorus, and the Order of Hermes, respectful, respectively. And the only tradition that to me is tricky to fit a, fit Jewish mysticism into are the Verbena. This, this sort of the obligate polytheism there is a bit of a barrier. With that, I will switch over to some of the questions we received. Are there any things from Jewish mysticism that we cannot respectfully use, no matter how we would use it? So I, I said before, I, I I actually think that there aren't. I think that being respectful does require some research, especially into anti-Semitic tropes, and but also into the context of these things. Like you want to avoid, you know, mistaking a simple use of the word evil to that, you know, in context means falsehood for the more I eat babies kind of evil of the Nefandi. There is nothing I can specifically think of that I would say don't use under any circumstances. There are many things that I would say be cautious when using this. Related, is there anything that, from Jewish mysticism that you think is interesting that we hasn't made an appearance yet? Uh, so I, I mentioned the Sephirot as a path to uh, as a path through Arate and towards Ascension. The 
focus on making them correspond to spheres in Mage, I think has been a pro has been you know a misunderstanding, and that it's much more interesting as a possible roadmap to ascension, especially when you combine it with uh, the modern descendants of Hecalot literature, where the whole point of it is to give a path to ascend to the throne of God. And, of, and I'm a huge fan of Merkaba mysticism for Mage because it's very practical. It's, oh, you want to do this? Here's what you do. You write these names on, co on a copper tablet. You, you harvest a flower at, at, um, at midnight on a full moon. You, you, know, you prepare this uh, potion for a month. And then you pour it out, and then you pour it out over a tombstone over a tombstone, and then this thing will happen. Like that's great. We we need more of that. There there's you know whole books of, of this stuff. Uh, some of them will be linked to in the show notes. So you've made mention of uh, the path towards ascension. What would ascension look like to a practitioner? This is another one of the questions that we kind of got. Uh, so ascension in Jewish mysticism is becoming one with the divine. So it's actually very similar, though arrived at from a very different path than what Ascension would look like for a Buddhist mage. There's a lot of Jewish Buddhist crossover in the modern world. And I think part of it is that the mysticisms are actually fairly compatible, considering that they largely developed independently of each other. So you've made mention to angels. What do uh, Jewish mystic angels look like? Are there any particular cool ones or any artists that you think of kind of at, capture the idea, if not necessarily the, the truth of what they look like? Jewish angels can look like anything. They, they look like what they need to look like in order to do their job. So mm -hmm. for instance, for all that people talk about biblically accurate angels being these weird things, the angels that showed up in Sodom and Gomorrah uh, don't have time to unpack how people, how Jews and Christians interpret that story differently. But the angels that showed up there show up just looking like a couple of guys. They don't, they don't even have wings or halos. They just look like a couple of dudes. Meanwhile, there's also depictions of angels as having, you know, four faces, eight wings, thousands of eyes. It, it really varies a lot. The Othanim, which are wheels, if I'm remembering right, uh, are like, three circles, each of which has eyes all around them, rotating around each other in some way. That's kind of weird and cool. Uh, lots of artists like drawing like drawing them, them. You can find that fairly easily. Cherubim are not, you know, fat little babies with bows and arrows. That's a kind of, that's actually a Greek notion. The Cherubim from Jewish mysticism are... They have, met, they have many faces, many wings. They have flaming swords. They are evoked on the, um, the Ark of the Covenant. They're very bizarre beings. They also don't really materialize in the same way. Like a lot of these weird angels don't, would, would be spirits I would not give the materialized charm to. Like they don't show up in the physical world constantly without some external power giving them that right. What would differentiate Jewish mysticism from Jewish faith and practice? And are there traditions that you feel, uh, lowercase t, or magical groups that accommodate that the non-mystical version of Judaism? So the lines between mysticism and practice and culture are very, very blurry with Judaism. Like even in the least mystic prayer books you find, you'll find poems that were written specifically with Kabbalistic numerology in them in order to evoke certain effects. It just... It's how things are done. Jews will often donate money to things in multiples of 18 because of the numerological correlation, you know, correlation between chai and life. And, and it's also good luck. Like These lines are very blurry. And, and historically, whenever rabbis try to stamp out some form of mysticism in order to focus on what they consider to be proper practice, they lose. My favorite example of which being there's a prayer told every... Uh, every uh, Yom Kippur, the holiest day of the year, called the Kol Nidre, which the rabbis tried to ban. And the Jewish people said, ah, eh, you're not the boss of me. The argument the rabbis used, so the prayer is in Aramaic, uh, a Semitic language closely related to Hebrew. The rabbis argued that angels can't understand, can't understand you. You have, to, you have to pray in Hebrew. And the people proceeded to completely ignore them. And then started praying in other vernacular languages. But to be consistent, the rabbis ended up coming to the conclusion, fine, angels understand every language except for Aramaic, which makes Aramaic a great instrument if you're a, if you're a you know, Jewish mystic mage and you don't want the angels to know what you're doing. 
Is there a New Age invocation of this at all outside of the Kabbalah, Kabbalah, Kabbalah? He said, mentioning three words pronounced the same but spelled differently. Uh, there was mention to New Age Merkaba. What is that, and does it actually bear any relationship to the practice you mentioned? I have not looked in depth into New Age Merka- uh, Merkaba. I- I've looked a little bit, and my first impression is this is badly misunderstood Hekalo. Why are you calling it Merkaba? Like there's some there's some stuff about like a spirit of light and ascending, and you can it can evoke a lot of the same things that Hekalo literature does, though in a very New Agey way. It's just bizarre that they're calling it Merkaba. It seems to have nothing to do with Merkaba, uh, as far as I can tell. Are there any pop culture? presentations of Jewish mysticism or other game presentations of Jewish mysticism where you're like, you know what, this isn't bad. And so aside from games that are just about Jewish mysticism, which there are several, though there are some publication related issues with it. Uh, The Ars Magica book, Mythic Judaism, gets a lot of things right. It is also the only place I've ever seen game mechanics for Talmudic debate. Uh, which is very cool. And it correctly identifies the best hermetic house being House Kriyaman and gives them bonuses for Talmudic debate. Now, I've heard rumors that there was some sort of plagiarism scandal involving it, which is why it's out of print, but I have not been able to confirm them. I I don't, so it's out of print, which is different from other Ars Magica books of the same era. Like you can't even buy a PDF of it. I bought a secondhand copy and I was very happy that I did. Uh, It was written by two rabbinical students, which is relevant. One last one. There are a few Jewish characters presented in the game. We get Rambam. The greatest mage of all time. The greatest mage of all time who was capable of undoing the curse of Cain. Maybe broke a sweat in the process, but we're not quite sure. One person claimed by several people is the figure of Solomon. Who is Solomon in mystical Judaism and what role can they take in the game? First, the sort of mythic notion. Solomon was the second king of the Jewish people third, actually, the second one in the Davidic line. He was King David's son, and he is known for being an especially wise ruler, and he was the last ruler of the United Kingdom of Judea and Israel. After him, it split, and things went badly for everyone, to put it mildly. So he is the one who built the temple, and in Jewish mysticism, he was wise enough that he is one of the... So there are several different sources of magic in Jewish mysticism, depending on where you look. He is one of them. Another is the angel Raziel, secret of, which means secret of God, who handed a book of secrets to Adam, and all magic is descended from that. And then there's also the notion that Raziel handed the book to Noah instead of Adam. All of those appear in various places. But there's also that Solomon simply was the first person to figure out how to compute, essentially how to compute the names of God and use them to achieve power. I don't wanna say Islamic mysticism, I'm gonna say Arab mysticism and and mythology. His name is pronounced Suleiman, and he is specifically mentioned in uh, Lost Paths uh, Taftani chapter quite a lot. He was instrumental in binding the jinni through the use of true names. There is, some argument that he is the source of true names as magic, as opposed to Hermes being the source of true names being magic. It is also possible that the two figures could be, you know, conflated by ma- by mages. Uh, after all, true names came out of that kind of Eastern Mediterranean, you know, Arab, Jewish, Egyptian, and Greek interchange. He is a source of magical knowledge. He especially knew the names of angels and demons and how to bind them. He's an important figure for the Chorus, the Order of Hermes, the Ali Batin, the Taftani, and several, and I think several other groups mention him obliquely. Even the craftsmasons, I think, uh, reference him and and the sacred geometry of the temple as being one of the things that they evoke. There are very few figures in mythology that stand taller and cast longer shadows in the mage world. Do you know anything about the Realms of Power, the Divine book for 5e for Ars Magica? Because that purportedly also included Judaism. Uh, it is a much shorter section. Okay. Uh, naturally, it's not a whole book on Ju- on Judaism. I skimmed it and didn't find anything that particularly stood out to me as bad. It wasn't as interesting as the Mythic Judaism book. Hmm. It is on my to-read list, but not very high. Uh, I'm not playing Ars Magica right or preparing an Ars Magica game. 
So I think that goes through all the questions that we had received. Are there any other closing thoughts or a project that you would like to uh, shout out to, or alternatively, what is uh, next on your Mage Horizon? I may or may not have rele- have released a book of uh, Minor Spheres for Crossover. And the next project that I'm working on writing, which will have some crossover with some things in this topic, because is a setting book for New York City, which is a city that is 10% Jewish. So you kind of have to uh, mention some of these things there. After that, I've got my, I'm hoping to finish up my expanded rules for focus. And next year is hopefully when I will get my Jewish magic book out. And when any of those happen, we look forward to having you back. Charles, thank you so much. This has been Mage the Podcast, where the only time we'd confuse Merkaba and Heckelote magic is almost all the time, because those just aren't things we talk about too often. Our executive producers make this show possible, and they include Buck Farmer, Oracle of Washi Tape, Christopher Phillips, Oracle of Surprisingly Nice Paper Clips, Mikhail, Oracle of Binder Clips with little smiley faces on them that always make me giggle, Jay Widener, Oracle of Sticky Notes with very good grip strength that also don't tear or leave residue, and the crew of Erebus. Oracle of Monogram Staple Removers. As a note for Oracle supporters who've been with us for at least six months, I just sent out the first round of One Point Wonders. Thank you for your support, and may the items I sent you allow you to hold and enjoy a point of task of your choosing. Additionally, I'd like to thank executive producers Alex, Alexia, Anders S., Andrew Edelstein, Anon, Birdo, Boo, Blaze Hibbert, Boogers, 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 Brother the Blue, Bryce Perry, Chris B., Daniel Cuppin, Daniel Scribner, Dan Svensson, David Roy, Dennis Osborne, Derek Semsek, Gargle Lenoir, George Laura, Guy Conan Stewart, Ebel, Jason Kennedy, Jason Vines, Jason W. Briggs, Jeff Brin, Jenna F., John Magnuson, Josh H., Joshua Heath, Kathleen Halperin, Leslie Weatherstone, Matthew Proyle, Michael Creedle, Michael Parker, Morgan Aron, Nathan Weaver, Nibero, Neil Patterson, Nikita Klimanoff, Oliver Schindler, Patrick McNamara, Patrick Mulder, Puka G., Rachel Grace, Ralph Scheinheimer, Ricardo, Richard Bat Brewster, Robart the Robot, Rob H., Ryan Kendi, Samuel Tobin, Stephen Carton, Thrice Great, William Conley, William Martin, and Zach Rules. Our EP shout-out is to Nathan Weaver, who I assume is simply a giant weaver bird. Weaver birds are a type of old-world passerine birds across 15 genera and 118 species who weave intricate nests out of vegetation. Many have stereotypically ridiculous bird names that are either just a guy's name or a description, like the Bagglefetch Weaver, Bannerman's Weaver, or the Red-Billed Buffalo Weaver. My favorite is simply known as the Sociable Weaver, who builds the most elaborate weaver bird nests of all. They are misnamed as their discoverer simply didn't spend enough time with them to realize that their hospitality was not their true feelings, and the birds immediately started shit-talking that ornithologist once he left. Thank you, Nathan. If you super liked this episode or super didn't, drop us a line at magesthepodcast at gmail.com or at magesthepodcast on Twitter. We have a hop in Discord community at discord.me slash magesthepodcast. If you like us, please give us a review on the platform of your choosing or tell a friend about us. Also go to magesthepodcast.com for show notes and all of our previous shows. Now go change reality. Bye.